Hello, everyone. I'm Alexandra Buchler, and I have the great pleasure and honor to be introducing this session on a kidlet from, uh, from Central Europe. It's the first one of, the, uh, of this year. You may have watched um, and attended the previous ones. And if you haven't, I would recommend that you do. You can find them on the uh, Facebook page of World Kidlit. And uh, this is also where we are streaming this one. And uh, the recording will be available later. Before I introduce um, the uh, wonderful speakers I have with me, I would like to say that you can ask questions uh, whenever they occur to you and you can put them in the, uh, in the comments um, section of the Facebook. And these will be then um, conveyed to us later. Uh, what we'll do is we will talk for about 50, uh, 40 minutes and then um, one of the World Kidlit team, uh, the um, inimitable Marsha Lynx Quayle will join us with questions. And we also have Mohini Gupta with us, who is uh, managing everything behind the scenes. So I will now introduce the speakers. And um, before I do that, I just want to say that we have narrowed down uh, Central Europe to, to the Visegrad Four. And so, um, we more or less represent each a country, but we also have someone with us, and that's um, uh, Julia Sherwood, who actually translates from all the languages of Central Europe, which is amazing. So uh, we have in the order in which, in, in which um, uh, I will be, um, I will be asking questions and the speakers will, will talk about, uh, about uh, the literature of the country they're representing. Um, we have uh, Anna Bentley and Anna is a translator from Hungarian. She is British, she lives in Budapest. And uh, this is also something that will show how, you know, we are, we are kind of all over Europe because we have, we have two Central Europeans, myself and Julia, who are in Britain. And we have um, Antonia Lloyd-Jones, who um, is almost Polish. She spends, when she can, she spends uh, quite a lot of time in Poland, but she is in London now. Uh, so, uh, Anna Bentley is um, a translator of Hungarian literature, and she has um, translated the children's classic Arnica, the Duck Princess, and you can find out more information about this book on World Kid Lit. Antonia Lloyd-Jones probably doesn't need introduction. Uh, she's, she's the leading translator of Polish literature in the UK. She has translated a number of Polish authors, including the prize, a Nobel Prize winner, Olga Tokarczuk and many others. She has also translated quite a number of books for children and young uh, readers, including Maps and Under Earth, Underwater. These are the very famous best-selling books, and she will tell us more about them. <clears throat> she also has um, been awarded the Transatlantic Prize, which is a prize or award, which is given to promoters of uh, Polish literature. Uh, Julia Sherwood translates fiction, non-fiction, mainly from Slovak, but also from Czech, Polish, and sorry, not Hungarian, Russian. Um, with her husband, Peter Sherwood, she has translated a number of books and some of which she will show us. And she also has launched together with Magdalena Mulek, uh, with whom she um, works on um, uh, presentations of Slovak literature on slovakliterature.com. She also is the Slovak um, uh, correspondent, I should say, for um, Asymptote magazine. Now, um, when we 
prepared this session and I have to say it was a lot of fun. Um, we um, first thought that we, we would uh, focus on characters and this is how it was presented on, on the World Kidlet website. We won't be doing that, we may mention some of the characters we, we were thinking about and what we'll be doing is we will, we will look at some shared, um, uh, shared themes um, that we actually um, discovered when we started talking about our respective our respective literatures uh, both for children and for adults and uh, Yulia very helpfully um, uh, listed these uh, shared characteristics or themes and I will very quickly go through them uh, one of them is tradition of beautifully illustrated books uh, some of them by uh, very famous artists, then um, well-known writers who write for adults also write for children, so it's not a specialized activity often. Um, there's um, another thing which is very important for me personally, and that's translated books. We all, we grew up with translated books, and I have a few here to show. Now, the um, uh, after 89, and this is again something we share, we share a history, uh, after 89, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the big established state publishing houses um, disappeared. Some of them survived, but mostly they didn't. And uh, there um, is now a number of new publishers, but also new independent publishers. So it is a very lively publishing scene and we will again mention some of these publishers. Um, now, um, there are other, other issues that we will, we will um, uh, identify, for example, adaptation of books uh, to animated TV series, etc., and also uh, comic books uh, which um, look back at history um, of the region or of the country. And um, Antonia mentioned a very funny um, uh, Polish book which looks at pre-1989 uh, life. Uh, there, there are books on the Velvet Revolution, uh, on city history, and also on some very sensitive and sad subjects in the in the more remote past, like the Holocaust and the war, uh, Second World War. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I'd like to show um, a few of the books I read as a child, and it was a long time ago, <laughs> and they have traveled with me around the world. This is Winnie the Pooh. And um, you can see the piglet with the fateful balloon um, here. Lovely illustrations. I'll never forget them. It, it, the moment I look at the book, I remember the story. Alice in Wonderland um, here falling down the rabbit hole. Uh, this is a book of uh, stories, oriental stories by Wilhelm Hauf, with beautiful illustrations by uh, the artist. Uh, and here is Under Sense, guess which story? <laughs> the Emperor's New Clothes. Now, um, I'd like to also mention some new books. And um, this one is an amazing book which takes you through historical Prague. The story is a bit like Alice in Wonderland. It's about a little girl who lives in, the, um, in, a, in a high rise and who falls through the drains into history. So here she is falling down the drains and she meets various characters, rat, um, seagull and so on, who guide her around historical Prague. This book is a, um, a classic which has been retold. It was the first publication of an imprint of um, uh, a publisher I greatly admire, Labyrinth, the imprint 
for young readers is called the Raketa, Rocket. And this is a story that was originally published in 1946. And it's about a little Alka bird or Razorbill, I think it's called. Uh, not a penguin, but um, sort of close to that. And um, it's a lovely story basically about the, 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 the desire to travel, to learn new things. Um, one more book by uh, a publisher again, who I admire greatly, Meander. And this is a book uh, by a famous author, Ludwig Watzulik, who was con convinced by the owner of the publishing house to write a book uh, for children. Again, lovely illustrations and a, a beautiful story. Now, before I finish uh, my short presentation of, uh, which, is, which is quite random and, and very personal, of uh, Czech literature, I would like to thank um, the Czech Literary Center, Czech Lit, and I will just very briefly show their, um, their website. And you can see that here you can find all sorts of resources, information about Czech literature, but also about support for, for publishers. Uh, there's, there's a wealth of information here, so I won't, um, um, I won't go any further, but do have a look. And um, if you want to find out more about uh, Czech literature, not just for children, but for adults as well. And if there are any publishers amongst you, um, you can also find out about support that uh, can be provided. So I'll stop sharing and I will um, now ask Anna to talk about Hungarian literature and I specifically asked her to tell us about how uh, Hungarian books for, for children tackle today's reality, how they, how they deal with issues which um, uh, range from diversity to, um, to sometimes quite sensitive and, and difficult, difficult issues. So, um, Anna, can you can you please start your presentation? Okay, thank you, thank you, Alexandra, and hello, everybody. Um, yes, just to give you a sentence or two of context. Um, you know, Hungary is the country, well, the Hungarian government that we have currently um, is the government that uh, basically was demonising migrants that were trying to make their way through Europe um, with a poster campaign and, and, and all kinds of um, unpleasant language. Um, so, you know, being a foreigner, just a foreigner in, in Hungary and uh, a visible foreigner can be, can be um, a little bit uncomfortable. But Hungary itself is actually a very diverse country. There are lots of different ethnic groups, for example. And this is something that's um, been recognized in the last five or six years noticeably, um, especially in the world of folk tales. So if I, if I can ask you, Mohini, to show slide number five, I can give you two examples. Thank you. Um, so these are two books produced by two different publishers, but by the, with the same wonderful illustrator, um, Laszlo Herbst. The book on the left, Obuvush Pushka, um, by George Frankovic, uh, the title in English is The Magic Rifle. This is a collection of Roma um, fairy tales collected from actually a, hung, uh, a Croatian minority area in Hungary. So these tales were told in Croatian by Roma people and uh, Boyash people to, to the collector. Um, but they often said that in their own language, the, the, the stories were even better. So, <laughs> so there's a lot of layers of language and, and cultural heritage going on there. Um, and this, the other book you've probably guessed is a, is a book of Jewish um, fairy tales and 
and proverbs and that kind of thing that was collected actually from English sources and Hungarian sources um, and I think also um, Israeli sort of sources but the, the aim was to have a book of well-written folk tales well folk tales from of Jewish heritage but but in beautiful Hungarian that Hungarian Jewish children could could use and read and enjoy. Um, the publisher of the first one is Mora, which is a big, a big uh, publisher in, in Hungary. The other one is, is Colibri, is much, much smaller. And uh, around the same time, if we can go to the next slide, Mohini, around the same time, um, this book came out, which is a new fairy tale, but written on um, very much with the language and the structure of, in this case, um, Roma fairy tales, which is interesting. Um, this is not a new phenomenon. In fact, the book that uh, Alexandra mentioned that I had translated, Arnica and the Duck Princess, was written by Erwin Lazar back in 1981 and very, very much exploits the, the motifs and the language of, of Hungarian folk tales mainstream Hungarian folk tales we could say and, and brings them into the modern world and mixes them up with what's going on in the modern world. Um, this book is interesting because it's not mainstream Hungarian folk tales but Roma folk tales that it's building on and the story is actually about an adopted child. So a child who is born to nomadic, um, a nomadic couple clearly very you know uneducated very simple lifestyle they live in the woods um, she's born to them and she is abandoned by them and adopted by a family from the local village and it's in three parts so the, the birth and abandonment the adoption and the growing up and the third part when she returns to the scene of her origins she meets her birth parents and and it's a good thing all round. Everybody benefits, which is wonderful. So it's it's very much a, a very much a happy story of reconciliation and and understanding and discovery. Um, the title Olan Yokinem Basilt, the girl who didn't speak, um, refers to the fact that in the middle section she doesn't speak the language of the village. She speaks the language of the woods. She mimics the sounds of the natural world, um, and that is beautifully beautifully written. Um, that's also by, by Mora, I should say. Um, mm, yeah, moving on. Um, so this brings me to probably the main focus of my, my little presentation, which is the book on the left, Masha Orsag Mindenki, which means fairyland is for everyone. So clearly that indicates that it's, it's a book about inclusive, inclusivity that aims to include people, everybody. Um, which is very much not the message politically that is coming from the Hungarian government at the moment. There are Hungarians and there are non-Hungarians, just like you know, there are patriots and non-patriots. Um, but this book was conceived as a book that would feature children and heroes and characters from marginalized communities. Um, and writers were invited to send in stories with that, with that remit in mind. Um, some of them use well-known fairy tales that would be that are commonly known, so Cinderella, um, Hansel and Gretel, and others um, build or, or rework stories that are not fairy tales but are in the culture, like Bambi, like The Prince and the Pauper, and so on. So many of them are recognisable stories, but with a twist. So the twist might be the genders are switched, which. I've recently seen a lot of in British theatre, which is interesting. Um, the twist might be that the character is a person of colour um, and that, that impacts on their story. Um, there are also uh, homosexual couples, so marriages happen, you know, stories culminate, cul culminate in a marriage, but it might be a marriage of two men. Um, there is a story uh, about, it's implied a lesbian couple, but two women that, that, that live together and enormously fond of each other. Um, it has become very well known here and, and in some circles abroad because of the reaction of uh, one particular Hungarian party, right-wing party here. The party is called Our Homeland, Omi Hazank, um, and the deputy leader of that party publicly shredded 
parts of this book, some pages of this book on Facebook, which is as, you know, as public as you can get, I think, in today's world, really, um, and denounced it as, um, as a poisonous book that Hungarian children should be protected from because it might, it might sway them in their sexuality, might lead them to be homosexual. So the right wing very much seized on the homosexual side of it, although that is not the main profile of the book at all. And in fact, another book that was shredded by the very same politician as the one on the right, um, which although it doesn't use folk tales, um, also features and encourage, features children from a variety of backgrounds, including a foreign child, who it's implied might be perhaps a refugee or a migrant living in Hungary, um, and encourages tolerance and understanding of, of these children for their differences. One child has two mothers, yeah, another child is not even what we would perhaps consider foreign, but comes from the Hungarian minority over the border in Romania. Um, and this one, like I say, also, also came in for, for that kind of criticism. Um, the, the one on the right, Vogain Vogoes, a harmonic A, has been, the title's been translated as Rough and Tough Owl and Class uh, Grade 3A. So it's about a school, a school group and the little owl that teaches the children to be tolerant. That's also uh, Pogorin, and the Mesha Orsag Mindenki was actually published by Labris uh, Lesbian Association, so not really a book publisher at all, which is interesting. Um, yeah, just bef before I went on there, but I don't have another slide for this, so we can stay on this slide. I just wanted to mention Chimorta publishers who produced a whole series, have produced a whole series of books that are focusing on um, minorities and marginalized people so for example disabled they also translate books bring books in on those kinds of themes so yes sorry moving on to the next slide um alexandra already mentioned this briefly um but there are you know great swathes of hungarian history that are painful and not much explored um in any in any in any sense or or twisted used exploited by by current um current politicians. Um, so it's interesting to see in books aimed for children what has been billed as the first book that deals with the Holocaust, first children's book to deal with the Holocaust. This is the one on the left, Ed Fiu a Chopper Boy by Dora Igaz, um, also Pogoin, which is a very, very interesting publisher. They have lots of great books. Um, the title means a boy from the team and you have two parallel stories, a group of boys who like to play football together in the present day one of whom is Jewish, and a group of boys who like to play football together in 1944, when one of their number was taken away to the camps um, with his family. And it's about what the other boys did or didn't do and the consequences of that and what can be done, what can't be done in the present day. Um, I think very interesting idea. The other book, Sepi Hazatiru Lelke by Josef Bikish, the title, is Seppi's soul comes home or is coming home uh, or Seppi's spirit comes home and uh, it starts with the ringing of a church bell this is why the church is featured on the cover um, that no one can account for in the middle of the night and it addresses the deportations of German uh, minority the German-speaking minority in Hungary after the second world war but also also the holocaust because it looks at the background to that um, a few years before. So I think it's interesting to see Hungarian literature tackling that as well. Um, yeah, I, I'm probably not going to go on to those because I'm aware that I haven't got that much time, but if we could, could we go right up to the top of my, um, top of my slide collection? Thank you very much, Mohini. Um, Alexandra said that we were, we were going to introduce a few characters, so I thought I'd just show you them very quickly. So, so here are uh, three or four real favorites that have stood the test of time since the 60s and 70s. Up in the top left-hand corner, you can see Annie Pani and her bear, Boribon, who have very everyday adventures, um, but very appealing, beautifully told stories. Here they are coming back from picking strawberries together. On the right is Kip Kop, who is the little conquer child, because in Hungary, children make uh, little figures out of conkers and matchsticks in the, in the autumn. And, and so he was conceived from that, I think. 
Kipkop is his name. And then there's um, the Czech-eared rabbit who flies with his ears. His ears rotate like a helicopter rotor blades and he can take off and fly around. And he uses his telescope and keeps an eye on his friends and goes in to help them, protect them from bullies or whatever as, as necessary. He's a very, very appealing character. Could we move on to the next one? All those were by the same, all those from the same brain, uh, which is the brain of Veronica Morik, who was trained as a puppeteer and worked at the Budapest um, Puppet Theatre for four years. And this is another book by her. You can see it's English uh, incarnation um, about a little boy who's scared of everything and a little lion that comes to help him be brave. And they do some physical training as well. Um, and because the puppet theatre, there's a lot of interaction between children's literature and the puppet theatre here. Books appear, they're put on um, the stage, and then things end up from books that have been on the stage. So just a quick glimpse, the next slide is the Budapest Puppet Theatre, which is a mecca for many children here. And the last thing I wanted to show you, so the last slide, the next one, please, sorry. Next one, Mohini. Again, connected to the Puppet Theatre, this is a book that the Chomor Tunde on the left is a book that, that I think would be an important one to have translated now into English. Um, Dora Gimeshi, the author, is, works at the, at the, as a dramatist at the, at the Puppet Theatre, and this has also be become a puppet play. And it's about family breakup and how it doesn't need to be the end of the world. And sometimes it's better for people to break up and find somebody that they really, they really are matched to. And the, the, the concept is that the not fairy, which is the Chomo Tunde, his job is to tie people together, but he doesn't always get it right. And sometimes you have to untie them and let them go off and find the people that they will be happy with. So I think that might be my time up. Is that right? Yes, thank you so much, Anna. Um, I think my suggestion to the organizers of these sessions will be that we need more time. I could, <laughs> easily, I could easily, you know, have a session on, um, on each of these countries, um, a, a separate session. So uh, thank you. Um, I, I would have, and, and thanks for covering everything, you know, in, uh, we, we discussed in, a, in, a, in quite a short time. Um, when we were preparing for this session, we also noted that not that many books from, uh, uh, from Central Europe are translated into English, at least. The situation is always different with your neighbours and so on. And um, there is one exception, I would say, and that's Poland. And I would like to ask Antonia to talk about that. Why has Poland done so well? Why does it have a, a, a couple of bestsellers it, just in this category of uh, books for children? And um, generally to give us her perspective on uh, Polish kid lit. Antonia, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, you showed earlier the Czech Lit site and the Poles are lucky enough to have a dedicated book institute, which is a state funded organization that exists to support literature at home and abroad. And over the years of its existence, it built up a very, very good support network for children's literature in particular, which means um, and also you can look at the Polish Book Institute website, it's very easy to find if you want to find out more. But it means that the Polish book, children's book publishers, and there are lots and lots of small independent new ones that are, are very active and, and very uh, innovative and interesting. Uh, they have a good solid presence at Bologna Book Fair, for instance, and London Book Fair with a very good stand. So they're very lucky to have that resource and to be able to make contact. And uh, to give you an example of a publisher that's been extremely successful and has made very good use of these opportunities, the one I would mention in first place is called Dvie Chostre, which means two sisters. And they have various amazing tactics. One is to commission very good authors with very good ideas. So this book that Alexandra mentioned which has now appeared in three editions in an awful lot of different languages all around the world. It's sold well over a million copies in different languages. It's absolutely beautiful. The publisher 
uh, Yadja Yendrias had the idea and commissioned Alexandra and Daniel Mijelinski, an amazing married couple team, to draw these incredible maps with a great deal of detail and um, features of each country, the food, the language, uh, different places and dances and famous people, etc. And of course, they're very useful in schools. Um, schools absolutely love them and they've won all sorts of prizes from teachers. So, and one of the ways in which this publisher has guaranteed the success of these books is by insisting on a uniform quality. So the books are translated in the given country, but then all the graphic and technical work is done in Poland. And that way they can guarantee that all the boxes are adapted to the right size and don't, aren't done in a kind of second rate way. And then that the quality of the paper is uniform and that the quality of the colour register is uniform and the font, which is a font they devised specially for these books. So I think the quality control is very, very important. So it means that this book has looked as beautiful everywhere that it's been produced. Um, so they've kind of created a brand. Um, and the other very, very good tactic, I think, that I really admire Katia Shostri for is that they make contact constantly with new young translators and encourage them to do draft translations of their books, which they can then use to pitch to publishers. And of course, it's wonderful because those translators then get um, a chance to to shine and, and to have their work published. So I would say that's a very, some very good lessons to be learned from this extremely competent publisher. Um, but there are, there are a large number of other small, excellent publishers working in Poland. Um, I just wanted to show you three examples of some books that have impressed me recently. One is actually uh, produced by a mainstream adult publisher. This book is called What's Your Sign? And it's by Michal Rushinek, who writes comic poetry and writes very funny books about literature and all sorts of things. And he works with his sister, who is an illustrator, Joanna Rushinek. And uh, Anna was talking about diversity and about difficulties with um, sometimes ideas within particular countries that, that might be considered rather sort of um, anti-diversity, let's just say. Um, and this book takes as its starting point a classic poem, which is called The Catechism of a Polish Child. And it was written in 1900, and once upon a time, every Polish child had to learn this thing by heart. And it asks and answers questions that are designed to instill proud, patriotism in the child um, and of course nowadays it's massively outdated it sounds terribly stern and nationalistic and I think even in its day it wasn't exactly the favorite poem of Jewish Polish children for instance and um, so it says who are you I'm a young Pole what's your emblem the white eagle um, or what's your sign it's the same the same word so this what's your sign is a modern reinterpretation which very thoughtfully represents those questions and answers them with very nice little rhymes um, that don't just encourage a gentle form of patriotism such as supporting your national soccer team but really encourage good citizenship and encourage you to be a decent human being so um, the text is all important uh, and just to give you a very simple idea of the text, I've done a sort of not terribly good rough translation of this first bit, which says, who are you? And the original answer was a little pole. But this time it says, if someone were to ask the question, who are you? I'd make a gesture, point a finger at my cap and say, you see a little chap, a member, as I'm sure you know, of our species, sapiens homo i'm a mammal young you see my mum can show the right id as a first in a family name plus an address that's all i claim etc and although you might say well this is a frightfully polish book actually 
although it has some Polish features, I think it could be translated to suit any country um, while retaining the core message about being a decent person and being nice to each other. So I think that's a very fine example of an intelligent and beautifully produced modern children's book. So then secondly, another thing that Poland is very, very good at are superb picture reference books. And I have, I absolutely adore this set. They're called the Mini Atlases. And there are three of them. They're by a married couple, Eva Kozera and Pavel Pavlak, and both of whom are superb artists who have a range of styles. And these books, one is about birds, one is about butterflies, and one's about small mammals. And each one features these spreads where um, there are, they're all creatures that, you, that, that artists have themselves seen in their own suburban garden. So there's a chance that the child, wherever they are, might see some of these creatures. They're not completely impossible to find in your own home environment. And each, each creature is featured through lovely collage pictures, um, paintings, little models that have been photographed and actual photographs and a bit of text. And I think they're just the most exquisite thing. And they're on, they're these board books. So they're nice and durable. And, um, and these are really masterpieces. They are absolute works of art, these books. And just so nicely done. And there's one, there's another one coming with cats, I think. Um, and that's published by Nashak Shengarnia, which is another of these superb publishers that just produces the most exquisite books again and again. Um, and then finally, Poland has a very strong tradition of illustration. And there's a, a quite a large number of very good young illustrators in the present generation. And they've inherited a lot from the past. And they're producing highly original and innovative picture books, which to me are great examples of modern art. So just to give you one example, this is Mr. Practical. It's illustrated by Adam Penkowski, I would say with a nod to Mondrian. And um, the story is by Roxana Jędrzejewska Brubel. This is published by Baita, which is another of the very good children's publishers. And um, it's a cat book, you'll all love this. It's about a man who's terribly, terribly serious. And he works very, very hard and he's got absolutely no time for things like having fun and silly things like that. But he is getting rather tired and he's overworking and stressing himself out and having weird dreams. And he starts, he tries exercise, but he takes rather a lot of pills and he's really not very well. And then somebody tells him that cats are very good for stress. So he decides, okay, I'll try this, I'll get a cat. So first he gets a manual on how to keep a cat because he's that sort of a person. Then he goes and gets a cat. There he is in the pet shop. And he um, takes it home and the cat and he just can't relate to each other. So he takes it to the vet and complains that its purr is broken. So the vet says, have you tried stroking it? which he hasn't. So it's a revolutionary idea, stroking the cat. So then finally he tries it. And at the end of the book, he and the cat are both purring and very, very happy. The end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonia. Uh, you wonderfully managed to squeeze everything again into a very short time, including cats. Um, and we have conversations about cats on Facebook with Antonia and other cat lovers. Um, I also love the way uh, Kidlit writes back to the governments of Poland and Hungary. And um, I'm, I'm kind of pleased because, you know, I'm a veteran of <laughs> the pre-89 time, pre, well, pre whatever, pre-80. And um, I'm glad it doesn't have to be done in some is that um, on, you know, carbon, <laughs> carbon copy, pay, uh, in, in carbon copy um, editions, which are sort of passed from person to person. So, hooray. Um, and um, 
now, uh, Yulia. We agreed with Yulia that we were going to mention one character that is um, uh, uh, that that is really loved by our generation and also um, more recent generations of readers. And we'll just show the book. I don't have it here, but Yulia has it. And uh, it's a lovely, lovely story by Ludwig Ashkenazi, who was a writer who, like many Czech writers, ended up in exile. Um, he was very interestingly married to the daughter of Heinrich Mann, and he lived in, uh, in Italy. Um, this book was written in the 50s and it's still read until today. It's the story of a lovely character, a little gnome or elf, who uh, leaves a book where he is, um, he is imprisoned with, with a goose who's very unpleasant and, um, and he sets out on um, a, a journey in search of a solo mate, of love, of friendship. And um, it's a book that has not been translated. And I, we have been talking with Julia about, you know, that it, it, um, it is a, a classic that uh, really deserves translation. So Julia, over to you. Uh, we are running over, over the allocated time, but please um, go ahead and <laughs> do your presentation. Thank you. Uh, just to, to finish on uh, Petrisek, or the title of the book could be translated as something like a quest to find the scent of uh, plum blossoms. That They are blossoms, you were right. And I just started rereading it last night and it is just utterly charming. I, I am going to finish it. I got to page 50 and it's just wonderful. It really hasn't lost any of its charm. But moving on to Slovak books, which I have to confess, I haven't followed the children's literature so closely in recent years because my daughter is grown up now. But uh, as since I started translating, I got more and more interested and so, uh, I've been also uh, asking my friends who have children and grandchildren. And so I will start, if you could uh, start my presentation, Mahini, with this book here, uh, Mimi and Lisa, which is a book I would like to uh, recommend for translation. Uh, this, uh, I have actually written an article about it for World Kid Lit, so I won't go into much detail except to say that uh, this is a book that uh, features one little girl who is uh, sighted and the other one who is blind, and it's, uh, it really uh, shows, uh, teaches children to understand otherness. So interestingly, it's also a book that helps to build uh, diversity, something that isn't really that... Uh, uh, embraced uh, in in these countries, but uh, children's literature is really uh, leading the way. Uh, this book was published by Slovart. Uh, this is one of the major publishing houses that start, was really established after 1989. And they also published uh, Webstrovci, which is a book about a spider family. And Drobci, uh, that's... Uh, uh, little Tots, and all three of these books uh, have also got to animated uh, series. Uh, then uh, the next book that I would like to recommend is Earthworms or Dajdjoki. Uh, can you move on to the next slide, please, uh, Mohini? Uh, this uh, this is a very different book. It's in black and white. Uh, it's got quite a striking aesthetic. And it's a book that's been inspired by the Montessori methods, and it uh, is supposed to help uh, uh, children develop uh, motor skills, and it's for all ages, from baby preschool to toddlers. Uh, if you could move on, we've got one more slide uh, with pictures of that book, and um, thank you. Uh, so you can touch it and uh, the, it's made of different materials, but it's a board, board book made of uh, hard, uh, hard paper. And the next uh, slide, please. Uh, this uh, is about the publishing house that uh, published uh, Earthworms. And that takes me to 
What I was going to highlight, and that is the emergence of uh, many independent small publishing houses uh, that I think are really a characteristic feature of uh, children's book publishing in Slovakia. So this came out from uh, EJ, and uh, this publisher has also championed uh, comic books, which have been seen generally as something trashy. And uh, so they commissioned a series of these four books uh, on the 30th anniversary of the Velvet Revolution, uh, an event that, although to us it may still seem very fresh, but uh, to the generation that came afterwards, this, this is ancient history. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, another publishing house that uh, is really lovely is uh, Egresh. Uh, means, it means uh, gooseberry. And uh, they have really visually very pleasing, lovely books, which I think are much more in tune with the type of illustrations that are common uh, in, in this country. Uh, but also what uh, makes this publishing house stand out is that uh, they feature, many of their books are on, on, on ecological subjects. And also uh, they are guided by very, uh, by these environmental values. Uh, they, the books are printed on sustainable paper, uh, they use recyclable packaging and have them printed either in Slovakia or the Czech Republic rather than sending them further away. And uh, Greta, if you could move on to the next slide, please. Uh, this is a book about a uh, whale uh, who is an opera singer and who loses her voice because of the pollution, because of all the uh, plastic uh, that's littering the bottom of the oceans. This book has actually been translated uh, into English by Jonathan Gresty, uh, published by Egresh. And uh, this is just uh, one example of this one, I think of only 13 Slovak children's books that I have counted uh, that have appeared in English, nine of them published in Slovakia. So that is partly a reason why they are not uh, that well known. And this is certainly not for a lack of trying. So the Slovak equivalent of the Czech Literature Center and the Polish Book Institute is a, a Information Center on Literature. They published this huge, lovish, uh, I don't know if you can see it uh, because I can't see my own uh, myself on the screen, but uh, I hope you can see it, a publication showcasing uh, showcasing uh, Slovak children's books uh, until 2009. This is prepared for the Bologna Festival in 2010. And uh, Slovakia is always present in Bologna. Uh, the books win lots of prizes, but still they somehow haven't made it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, or maybe you can jump over to the following one. So this is just uh, from the catalog of Egresh. Next one is uh, Monokel. Uh, uh, this uh, publisher does uh, books on the environment like this Franciszek's Compostu. Uh, it's Frankie from the compost heap, but also books uh, that, uh, for example, uh, the magic uh, metropolis, uh, Bratislava, the magic metropolis. This was actually translated by me and my husband. Uh, the only children's book we worked on uh, so far. And uh, this uh, is a book about uh, a, a magical ride on a non-existent metro in Bratislava. And very briefly, because I think we're running out of time, uh, I've got a few more slides uh, showcasing some books by other publishers. So if you could move on, please. Uh, we've got two slides on Frankie from the compost heap. Uh, you can move on to the next one. Uh, yep. Yeah. And then uh, the next one is about uh, one more publisher I'd like to talk about. Uh, this is uh, Brack. Uh, so there, the escape. Again, I, I'm showing the book just to see the size uh, in case you can see um, me there on, the, on your screens. Uh, this is by Marek Vadas, and it's a book about internal displacement in Africa, not really a subject that uh, is covered very much uh, in, in Slovak literature or, or in the Slovak media, so this is really wonderful. And the next one, which I would love to see, I haven't seen it yet, it's quite new, Posledni Permonik, 
or The Last Mine Gnome or Nine Mine Elf. Uh, this book is set in um, the mining town on, of Kremnica. It's a medieval town which has the longest running mint, I think, in the world, maybe. It had a gold mine, and uh, there was an old legend whereby miners were accompanied by these little uh, elves called uh, Permoniks. And in this book, a little boy today meets uh, Permonik, who then shows him around, introduces him to the old legends, and then uh, the little boy introduces him to present day life, for example, fitness centers. And I think I will uh, stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yulia. And uh, I feel Czech Kidlit was a bit shortchanged because I tried to race through what I prepared. Now, uh, can we have Marsha with uh, questions? Hello, Marsha. Thanks Hello. <laughs> so the first question from Megan is whether, can you please tell us about state funding for publishers in the countries featured here? Many thanks. So if there's anybody who wants to leap on that. Um, well, I'll, I'll maybe start because I didn't, didn't mention anything, but there is um, in its new new re reincarnation, uh, an organization now called uh, the Petrofi Literary Fund um, that gives grants to translators and to publishers in Hungary, but also will give grants to publishers abroad that are interested in publishing a Hungarian book. Um, so the grants for translators and publishers here are for sample translations. So they will pay for you know, 30 odd pages or so of, to, of a book to be translated. Um, and then it's really up to the translator and the publisher to, to pitch it. Um, but they also produce brochures. Um, they've only been going a year or so because there was a different organization before it was all, it was all reorganized. Um, but they've already produced ooh, four or five brochures on different themes, including two Three, if you include the illustration one on children's books, one was a publisher's choice and the other one was sort of their choice. They have like a committee of people who are all in the book world and, and interested in the translation world um, in which they showcase a, a number of books with a sample translation, a short, you know, a short summary of the book and some pictures and so on. Um, I think the aim of those, the aim is to take those to book fairs, but of course there haven't really been any book fairs since they started, so, um, but that's the, that's the long-term plan. The other support that they're offering, which is really quite new, I think, they're saying micro grants, so that, for example, um, if I have an author living here that I would like to take to London to a reading or an event or something, I can apply for some money to help pay for their the plane or whatever so just to just facilitate that a little bit so that's the kind of support that there is here and they have their own website so if you go to plf petrofi literary fund um, you can see more about what they're up to there could i just mention slovakia has the, the information center on literature and their website in english uh, has a helpfully simple name books from slovakia and on it you can find the latest uh, catalog children's books from slovakia from which some of those spreads uh, that i showed were taken so you can find all the information there and they also provide grants i should say actually sorry just one last quick quick thing on plf is that they've done these lovely brochures but at the moment the link from their website main website doesn't take you to them but they have a facebook page and you can find them on there <laughs> um and i can say um about the polish book institute that it has two very useful grant programs one allows translators to apply for money under the samples program and to uh prepare translations that they can then pitch and once a publisher has bought the rights that publisher can apply to the Polish Copyright Poland translation program for funding towards the cost of translation and also towards production and marketing costs so there are some very useful grants available and um, again look at their website Polish Book Institute 
and they also, in concert with the Polish IBBY, produce a beautiful brochure once a year. Um, here's an example of one of them, um, featuring all the IBBY award-winning books of the year and giving a bit of information about them. These come in, in, in different forms. They're always redesigning these publications. And they're very good as a point of reference. If you don't know anything about the recent Polish children's books, that's a very good first place to go to find out what's been published recently with success, what's already selling well in Poland. Thank you. Great. So there's a lot of people asking about the books that have been mentioned. I think they went by pretty quick. And so um, I think we'll have all of those afterwards. But people are particularly, they want to know more about the cat book, Antonia. About? Sorry? The cat book for Antonia. <laughs> um, this book, Mr. Practical, you could call him, I mean, I, I have actually translated this whole book. Where's my translation? Here it is. Um, I think I called him something else. Uh, no, yeah, Mr. Practical. He is Mr. Practical. Um, when I've shown this to publishers, which I've, I have tried pitching it, they said there's too much text. And this is something that happens with, um, I think, the English language expectations for children's illustrated books are that there, there's even Mondrian there. <laughs> he admits it. Um, uh, sometimes it felt that there's too much text. but of course that could be reduced quite easily um and i think it's a delightful book because it really is it, it's got the message about how we let our lives just be filled with work and nothing else and how we cease to be able to relate to anything um i just love the way he's developed this modern style for this book and how gradually you know through nature through the contact with the cat, this man is broken down. And there's a sort of normal person compared with the formal person. And then this rather magnificent cat. It really is. The cat's rather a formal cat, too. And, but then the cat's sulky face is just so glorious. And there's still the pills here, but they're cat, cat um, pills now. And then the vet who explains about stroking. And there's the cat in this book. Um, so if there's any publishers who are interested in this magnificent, beautiful, charming book, I like that the best. Look at the cat jumping up on him. <laughs> you know, I think anyone who publishes that will be purring at the end, quite frankly. So if anyone's interested, please get in touch. And it's from Nasza Księgarnia, that's the Polish publisher. Well, so, uh, just, so we are running out of time, but I, I would like to ask one more question from Katya. She says, some of you mentioned books that fo focus on social issues, the environment, being a good citizen, embracing diversity. Do you see this as a growing trend in Central Europe? So anyone who wants to leap on that one? Well, I think it certainly is in Hungary. Um, like I said, it's it's you know it spans a few different publishers, um, and and it mirrors you know debate on non-government media <laughs> sites about you know who else there is actually living in Hungary and and disability, for example, and young adult books. There's a lovely lovely novel novel called. Uh, Sabad Lab on, on, which doesn't really translate, but it's about being about a young teenage lad in a wheelchair who runs away and his his adventure. Um, so it's happening in young young adult as well, not just not just uh, picture books. The same thing is very true in Poland, and uh, again, particularly middle grade and young adult books. There are lots and lots that try to address issues that may be difficult 
for children to understand or that, that where they might need a bit of help. And this is all done in a sensitive way. And there are lots and lots of books about otherness and diversity. For instance, this one has now come out in English, which is about a little skeleton boy who makes friends with a little live girl and they show each other their worlds. So her world is full of sunshine and rainbows and so on. And then his world is sort of full of dead people. <laughs> but it's, um, it's a way of, of um, exploring otherness. Um, so I would say in, in Polish literature, exactly the same thing is happening, exploring all sorts of forms of otherness and explaining things to children and trying to help them with potential problems. It's also definitely the case in Slovakia. If you look at that uh, latest catalog, there is also a book about a little autistic boy, uh, about an uh, unusual family, the divorced. Uh, and in interestingly, the stronger the calls for returns to traditional values are in society and in politics, the more I think this trend is visible in children's literature, which I think is great. We have any more questions? Um, yeah, but I think we we're up. running up against the end of time. So, okay. um, I mean, we, if you want, we can ask one more question. This is a question for Anna. Um, Christina wanted to know um, if if any of the books you'd mentioned were being translated into English, and then also um, if you know about Hungarian kidlit being translated into German or into other other European languages. Um, I don't know of any of these that are being translated into English. Um, I had a little look to see where the grants, for example, whether there were any children's books in these grants that are being handed out by the Petofi Literary um, Association. And there are children's books being, trans being supported for translation into Macedonian, into either Bulgarian or Ukrainian, into Czech lots there were three i think into czech um so the the neighboring countries languages um seem that seems to be going on quite a lot um there may have been one german one i'm afraid i don't remember there was one that actually looks like a children's book it's a very interesting book it looks like a children's book but it really isn't for children um and a friend of mine who translates into arabic won a grant for that of this doesn't mean that these will actually be published, of course. The, these are the sample grants for the translators, but it enables the translators to then pitch the books. So it, it, ups, it ups the chances. Traditionally, Hungarian books were translated into Russian and you know, Eastern Bloc languages, first and foremost. Um, and in fact, the publisher of Arnica read it in Russian before I gave her the whole text in English. So, you know, that's that's still sort of the direction that, that works or, or more the neighboring countries. And it would be nice if more more made it into English. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the support is there, as you said. And uh, so I think it's a question of really getting through to the publishers in in English, um, even in German. I mean, Czech books. Um, uh, the, uh, the the grant system um, is actually quite generous. I was I was surprised at the amount distributed in the last round, and English is one of the target languages, if not the target language, for obvious reasons. Yeah, it's the big catch for publishers, but it's it's the hardest catch, perhaps. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, shall we? I, I'm, I'm sure we could go on, but um, we can't. <laughs> so uh, we'll have to wrap up here and uh, thank you very much. It's really difficult speaking to an audience you can't see, <laughs> but this is where we are now. So thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you, Anna, Antonia and Julia. Thank you, thank you very much, and Marsha and the rest of the World Kid Lit team. Thanks thank for inviting you. me. Bye bye. <laughs> Thanks, Alexandra. Just Bye. before we go off, the session will remain on our Facebook page and available on our YouTube channel later as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.